I'm Ted Seides, and this is Capital Allocators. This show is an open exploration of the people and process behind capital allocation. Through conversations with leaders in the money game, we learn how these holders of the keys to the kingdom allocate their time and their capital. You can keep up to date by visiting capitalallocatorspodcast.com. My guest on today's show is Tom Bushy, the founder of Sunderland Capital, a Boston-based hedge fund he started in 2016. Tom graduated from the Wharton School as an undergraduate and worked as an investment banker at Credit Suisse First Boston, a private equity analyst at Thayer Capital, a hedge fund analyst at Millennium and Mayo Capital, and a portfolio manager at BlackRock before trying his hand on his own. Even with that stellar resume, the road to success running an asset management business has plenty of obstacles along the way. Our conversation tells Tom's story of what happened through his career and the launch process. He shares an inside look from a manager's perspective of what it takes to get a fund off the ground. As an important aside and disclaimer, I've known Tom for a while and have been advising him for the last two years. I happen to like him a lot, both personally and professionally, but you should know I have a small vested interest in his success. Once again, I want to thank Peter Taboris from Strong Point Wealth Advisors for sponsoring this episode and our podcast guest dinner series. We had a second dinner bringing together guests from the show a few weeks ago, and it was another fascinating evening. Peter's a gracious host, and I'm thankful to have his support and that of Strong Point for our dinners. Without further ado, please enjoy my conversation with Tom Bushy. Tom, great to see you, bud. Thanks for coming to see me. Appreciate it. Yeah. When did you first get interested in investing? I've always been interested in business. I think the first exposure I got was my mom's side of the family built a entrepreneurial car dealership from one Fiat store in Newport, Rhode Island to a pretty large regional network. And we used to go every Sunday, we'd drive from the middle of Western Massachusetts down to Rhode Island. And I'd soak up all I can from my uncle and my cousin who were running the business. And that was sort of the first taste I got. How old were you when you first got interested? I was probably 11 or 12. I mean, I like did everything. I swept the floor, washed cars, and they'd let me tag along. You know, I had no business being in the meetings I was, but they'd let me sit in the corner and just listen. And that was the first taste and obviously was young and didn't really know what I wanted to do. But that's where I first got the bug. I thought it was cool and I loved what they were doing. The people and the place and the growth, and it was the coolest thing to me. And that's really what I felt like I wanted to do. I wanted to be an entrepreneur. I didn't know what that meant or how that would progress or anything, but that was the first taste. And that was a very lucky and very cool experience for me. So, what did you do with that initial spark? I didn't know what to do with it other than I wanted to figure out a way to eventually run my own thing, whatever that thing was going to be. I wanted to be able to work with people I really liked and trusted and hopefully add some value to the people who were being a part of it. And that I'd never had this master roadmap. I just thought, okay, how do I learn how to be an entrepreneur or learn how to be a business person? And you can't really other than doing it. You know, I learned that the hard way (laughs) over the last 15 years, but I felt like I just wanted to surround myself with people who, who did that. And, you know, I've been, trying to soak up as much from people in that position ever since. Even in what we do now, if you look at of our 50 LPs, most of them are entrepreneurs in some form or fashion, either run an asset management business or have built their own company. And those are the people I still want to spend time with. And that's what I love to do. And that's what we do in our business. For whatever reason, from the time I can remember, just being around people who are managing, building, and growing businesses is what I love. And however I can get exposure to that, that's always been the spark that's interested me the most in figuring out how did you build this? What do you do? What's interesting about the market you're looking at? Being around people and understanding that the group of people driving the organization is generally what makes the difference between something great and something not so great. That's been a huge lesson for me and something that I've tried to gravitate to. So is that what drove you to Wharton? It's a really weird thing conceptually to think about a 17-year-old kid being like, I want to go to undergraduate business school and lock myself into that trajectory. But yeah, I wanted to learn. I didn't know if that would be a helpful push to be an entrepreneur or to learn business, but 
it's what I loved and what I wanted to do. And so I wouldn't necessarily say Wharton was this great academic experience. It was more hunger games for a bunch of people like me. And (laughs) that's valuable, sort of. I really enjoyed my overall undergrad experience, even though Wharton was a little too specific for a lot of the skills I wish I had. What skills did you feel like you missed from that experience? Spending like a year of your life learning how to make a very rudimentary DCF model doesn't really apply in the real world so much. It's amazing how much I learn every day being around people who actually run businesses for a living. You can't really learn it without doing it. (laughs) I thought I could be as prepared as I could be, but really my whole career I'd kind of been left in a corner and they're like, pick a good investment. And if you can do that, then you can kind of have a decent career. The subtleties of managing people and running an organization, I tried to learn either through a book or through a professor or through talking to as many people as I can. And it's hundreds and hundreds of people. You can't really learn unless you do it. And I've learned so much over the last three years of even just managing my tiny little business. So when you're coming out of school, and you knew you had this long-term goal of something and running a business, what first step did you take out of school to start your career? I went to New York and did investment banking, which is pretty much the assembly line of Wharton undergrad. I think they essentially manufacture bankers. And it was great. It was a little bit after the first internet bubble, 2002, 2003 timeframe, and the market had begun recovering. So there was actually work to do, which was nice. I worked at Credit Suisse First Boston surrounded by a lot of very smart and very talented people who gave me a lot of rope. It was hard. It was old school investment banking as the most junior person on the totem pole, but you can't really get thrown in the fire much better than that experience. So with the benefit of time, I actually have a pretty fond memory for all I went through during that time. And that was a two, three year program? Yeah, exactly. And what was the next step after that? I was approached by one of my clients I did a deal for, a small middle market private equity firm based in Washington, D.C., And again, getting back to this concept of what do I enjoy? Again, I just wanted to be around people who built businesses. And of the bunch of different options, there was sort of a banking 2.0 private equity path of the big firms. I didn't really want to do that. The firm I joined was called Thera Capital. And of the six partners there, four had been operators or chief executives of of very large, very well-known companies. And that was very, very appealing and a very flat organization. So that was a pretty easy next step for me. It was sort of the first go around in the heyday of private equity, 05 to 07. So it was a a pretty interesting seat to have. While I was there, the chairman of the firm did a couple different things. So they had their traditional middle market buyout fund, but he'd also pioneered a strategy, which he called strategic block investing. And all that really means is he'd go in a company that had gotten into trouble in the public markets, buy between 5 and 15% of the company, and they'd go on the board and they'd try to fix it and make it better. With almost an infinite time horizon, they made investments while I was there and even in the late 90s that they're still involved with today. And for me, that's really where the light bulb went on. When I was in private equity, I was the associate in charge of handling sort of the mail would come in and you get 15 companies to look at and you'd pick one and you'd go bid and there'd be 50 other bidders on that. And that just never struck me as an efficient way to allocate capital. The light bulb for me really went on when I looked across the room and saw what Fred Malik was doing. And I was like, that's the thing. Like, that's it. Like, I wish I could figure out how to do that. That was the thing that made sense to me. And that's fortunately what was really attractive about the public markets ever since. And so how did you make that transition? Because you go from banking to private equity. Now you have this spark of interest in a certain style of investing in the public markets. What'd you do? So it was a little bit of personal experience. My wife was graduating medical school in New York, matched her residency in Boston. So I knew for personal reasons I wanted to be in Boston and got a random headhunter call from a group out of London saying, hey, there's a hedge fund in Boston. Would you be interested in joining? And so I moved up uh, after my two years were up and started being a public market investor. And that was first part of 07. And what felt differently when you started in the public markets from your experience in the private markets? It was just so different from a time frame perspective and an IRR perspective, right? It was billions of dollars, literally billions of dollars of capital chasing three, four, five, 10% returns. And that just, it was with events or deal closings or quarters or speculation on who would buy what and how. And it was very different than what I was used to. I mean, I was at a firm that probably had $10 billion of 
gross market value to event-driven stocks. And I was the only person in the room at 27 who'd ever done an LBO. So it just, <laughs> you know, it was kind of crazy. <laughs> it didn't seem logical to me. And obviously what followed wasn't necessarily a surprise, but still in the back of my mind was, okay, let's think about what should work. What is a rational time horizon and how to really gain that experience with the sort of myopic stuff that doesn't make sense to me. And let's figure out at least how I can do the best job I can for the firm I'm working for. And then also, okay, if I can absorb this and figure out what people actually are pricing in, maybe at some point in the future, that'll be a help. Just being involved in the market on a day-to-day basis, even that short-term day-to-day helped me learn a lot about how to absorb that into a process going forward. So it was every step along the way has been a good one. And that was a good first lesson. So what happened in 08? Like most firms at the time was relatively levered, thought they were hedged in every way. At the firm I worked for, there were three Cambridge PhDs who would send me a spreadsheet saying it would be impossible to lose more than 5% of our portfolio. That was the model we'd get in the morning. Like we have hedged in Greek letters that are still not familiar to me and basically made this mousetrap of impossibility to lose money. The truth of the matter was obviously all that those historic correlations broke down and it didn't work out. And I found myself seeing the early version of a movie that would play out in 08. So that was my first experience as a public market investor. And how long did you stay there then? I was there for about 18 months. The firm had grown from almost nothing to 3 billion very quickly. And then the other lesson I learned early on was $3 billion of capital is not the same as a $3 billion private equity fund. And so as quickly as that goes up, even if performance isn't bad, it was primarily European fund of funds money. And that That was a piggy bank very quickly, and I learned that lesson as well. So having the right partners and the right duration of capital is obviously something that was seared into my memory very early on, and I'm I'm lucky that happened at that age. One of the things you haven't talked about is brands. And so you worked for a middle market LBO shop, you worked for a small hedge fund, and then you go to BlackRock. (laughs) How important do you think branding is say early in your career as you're trying to learn? I wouldn't say I ever had a conscious plan. I just tried to go to the place that would give me the most responsibility. There wasn't really a master plan around branding. It just so happens that I worked at what is now one of the largest hedge funds in the world during 08 and 09 because they were pretty much the only person who was hiring. And BlackRock gave me at 32 years old the opportunity to go from being a senior analyst to being a portfolio manager. And that was an opportunity I was incredibly grateful for. And I got to learn a ton. And uh, there was no master plan around either of those. I would say both of those experiences probably gave me a different sense of how hard it was to raise outside capital than it should have been. You didn't have to market. You just get a phone call being like, XYZ client wants to send you a large pile of money. Would you take it? And you say yes. And that's <laughs> how it works, which is uh, obviously very, very different from uh, the experience of starting your own firm. So again, the process for me has always been try to throw yourself into as deep of a pool as you can and figure out how to swim. And I'm grateful that those firms gave me the opportunity to do that. You had a portfolio management role at BlackRock. Were you running your own fund? I was responsible for three different funds, the third of which essentially I had this idea of how I thought I was good at managing money. It didn't really reflect on what maybe is the best marketing fit or what could be a huge multi-billion dollar fund within a place like BlackRock. It was, this is the way I view efficacy around what I think is a structural advantage for the long term. I took it to sort of a product committee, if you will, and they said, that's great. We don't think it can scale, but if you can find a client to do it, go do your thing. And I was really fortunate to have a client who backed it, and we really started incubating what is now the process that we have here at Sunderland about a year and year and a half into my tenure at BlackRock. And I was obviously a fiduciary across all three, managing a lot of money in aggregate, but very teeny, teeny amount of money in the fund that I thought was how I wanted to invest. And so it was a relatively riskless way to try out this process that I'd been tinkering with and toying with and implementing at various stages throughout my career. How do you describe that strategy? It's kind of pretty simple. The biggest opportunity I saw in the market and still see even today is smaller companies with great assets, great people, great brand, 
sometimes get into short-term trouble and the stocks trade. It's going back to those early days of private equity where if I got that book across my table at that valuation, I wish I could do that over and over and over again. And you don't get that that often in private markets. They're relatively efficient. But in the public markets, especially in months like we just had in October, you're able to buy really great long-term outcomes for half off of a multiple you'd, you'd be willing to pay for in the private markets. And if you can just really hold them for a rational time horizon, call it five years. There's a lot of things that can go right. You can be wrong, but the risk rewards are incredible. And I just wanted to put in practice a very different entrepreneurial ownership perspective. Again, that was the thing that I've always admired and wanted to do. And if in some small way with whatever dollars I can cobble together, do that, I think that will be something different and something powerful for a small group of investors who would entrust me to do that. So that's kind of the plan. So you're running these three funds at BlackRock, and one of them is where your heart and soul is, and the other, say, is paying the bills or whatever it is. How do you decide when you feel like you're ready to do your own thing? The light bulb went on for me in particular around one deal. It was sort of the setup I had waited for we bought a big slug of a company from in a sort of complex transaction that gave me a really good insight into the business and also a great price. Ultimately, that business ended up getting sold. And I looked at the end of the day and I, because I was a fiduciary across large dollars, I couldn't size it in the way that was I should have for what was this incubation for what I wanted to do. And that was fine. That's how it should have been from a fiduciary perspective. But I just felt like it was sort of halfway stepping into this thing that I wanted to create. And I wasn't really doing it as well as I could have. I didn't feel like I was concentrated at a place like BlackRock. I was the outlier. And so there were all these sort of mathematical backs and forth with, okay, what's the efficacy of what we're doing? Why are we doing this? And there was a governor on what I wanted to do. And so I approached the client who seeded this fund at BlackRock. And I said, would you support me if I did it independently? And I was really lucky that they said yes. And so in that conversation, do you leave and then have that conversation? Do you talk to the people at BlackRock and then have that conversation? How does that work? I talked to the client and just, I laid it out and that was their support. And it was one, <laughs> it was just one person, again, was enough for me because I had always wanted to do it. And it certainly wasn't about size given the dollar amounts, but it was about wanting to invest in a way that I felt proud of and felt like I was doing the best job for the strategy that I believed in. And that was it. So you had the strategy you wanted to pursue in a box you felt like you couldn't quite pursue. You had a client on board. What were the other key considerations in saying, okay, I'm ready to take the leap? The nice part about being at BlackRock was I went from being an analyst to managing a portfolio. I felt comfortable that I'd made enough of the mistakes in the actual construction management. I felt comfortable that I was doing it the right way for me. What I thought I knew and turns out I really didn't, running a business is a very different thing. So I felt like I was ready from an investing perspective. I also felt like I kind of knew what I was doing from setting up a business. Turns out that wasn't the case, but... I felt comfortable in the process of how we were going to invest because I believed in it so much. I felt like others would. And that definitely didn't turn out to be the case. But all the mistakes I had made from being an investor, I kind of had the rope to hang myself with over the last six or seven years. I felt comfortable from an investing perspective. I had the support from an anchor tenant. And that was good enough for me. I just really wanted to start and having one client was in my mind all I needed and we went from there. Did you think about like financially the risk management of your own life? It wasn't necessarily a consideration because in hindsight I was probably wildly over optimistic on how that would <laughs> turn out. So I had been fortunate in a lot of respects, but money's just never been the driving factor for me. It's always been where can I go? Obviously, I do fine, but how do I learn the most? Who's going to give me the most rope? And how am I going to learn for myself what works for me to be ultimately, hopefully, a, a decent investor? And hopefully, that has merits to some subset of clients. And I felt comfortable enough in that to take a leap. And we never had 
a lot of pressure from a, I have to make X number of dollars to be in business. I, I didn't really set it up that way. And again, our initial client was also very supportive of our business financially as well. So they were willing to help me spend the amount of money necessary to set it up institutionally. And that was important to me. I didn't want to just get an office in the suburbs and have me in a Bloomberg. That was more of a fear of mine than any of the monetary risk. I wanted to at least do it in a way that was appropriate for setting up a long-term business. Was there a moment in time that you remember saying, oh man, from the beginning of that in a really good way or a just eye-opening way? First year or two, I probably had that feeling, I don't know, once a week. I never thought it would come easy or quickly. Obviously, I thought perhaps there were a range of outcomes that would be from half decent to pretty good. There's just such a fine line between those outcomes. But you never know. There's never a perfect time for anything. And so I just wanted to get started. And I just wanted to do it. And I felt ready. And my belief was, as long as one person believes in me, I'm going to work really hard to try to figure this out. And that was more exciting to me than any of the potential. You block out the negative and you just go. Do you have any vivid recollection of that moment when you said, aha, I'm doing this? You try to just take as many good positives away. I mean, even when a particular allocator would send me an email saying, I want to meet with you, right? I was so naive to what that even meant. I was just pumped. I'm like, wow, someone wants to talk to me. There's a lot of good things that come with that in that you can accept the small things that aren't necessarily financially rewarding as milestones of, hey, I'm proud. Like we started this thing. We're doing it. Someone wants to listen to what I have to say for an hour. That's some of the great advice I got, honestly, was one, be really grateful for that. And two, feel proud that that's a milestone, right? There's no financial reward to that. The probability that person's going to give you money is almost zero. But I didn't know, and I enjoyed it. And all of those things up front were wonderful lessons for us that you just can't learn without doing them. And so that was kind of cool. You've had this excitement about business from when you were young, and now you're starting your own business. How did the startup of a hedge fund resemble other businesses you've looked at? You can read as many books or as listen to many people talk about it as you want. The entrepreneurial cliches are there for a very large reason. Most of the things we've gone through, pretty much every entrepreneur or startup has gone through, it's really difficult to learn your way out of them. You can get lucky. You can plan. But really, if you're starting a business for the first time, it's highly probable that you're going to make all the mistakes that I have and a million other entrepreneurs have. What are the cliches that most resonate? It's not even a cliche. I think what I didn't appreciate is you have to be happy building it with people, both who are your clients and who are your partners, with a similar vision for long-term success. You need to take care of them as well as you can and you need to be happy and grateful doing it. If you don't have those things, no matter if we were a billion dollar startup, that wouldn't be success to me. I kind of went through that and really appreciate that now. And we're going through uh, hiring a CFO for one of our portfolio companies now. And just the experience I went through as an entrepreneur, just I can key in on things so much differently than when I was just an investor. Whatever hardship or difficulty we went through in the moment has all been really interestingly very additive to my day job. And what's an example maybe as you're thinking about a company hiring a CFO of something you now understand that you didn't before starting your own firm? Understanding that just because someone looks great on paper, that's maybe the beginning or maybe not even an important part of the overall decision. Buy-in, culture, belief in the organization, personal qualities – just massively outweigh a great resume. And people with great resumes have the right qualities too. But again, my bias before I was an entrepreneur myself was whoever looked good on paper, whoever had sort of social proof of they've been great before, maybe they're great this time. That stuff all becomes so much less important after you've really worked with people in an environment where it's not always easy, especially in companies that are growing, the personal attributes of the individual, a part of the company are just so much more important than I ever gave them credit for. So you're now, let's get right to the phase where you're planning to launch the firm. How do you think about who you want on the team before you start? The couple of keys for me were 
I'm an analyst. Everything I have to see, touch, feel, and do. The prospect of having a big team or sector analysts or, you know, that can work for a lot of different people. It, it couldn't work for me. I just didn't feel comfortable not having primary responsibility, again, on a small portfolio of names. The one thing I wanted to make sure of is that we built a middle and back office that was world-class or at least could pass muster of a diligence test, right? I didn't want to be lucky enough to have an investor we wanted to partner with come in and check our systems and books and be like, okay, sorry, you guys are too small or whatever the case may be, or you're not ready yet. I didn't want to build it as we go. I wanted to build it right the first time. And so that was an important part to me. And we got lucky and hired a great CFO who's been wonderful and done that. And then marketing, I would say whatever you want to call it, business development, marketing, the truth of the matter is in a small firm, it's next to impossible to have someone else sell you. I think LPs or partners, at least the ones we have, we have 50 LPs in our fund. I know all of them personally, (laughs) which, and I like them and I trust them. And that's what has whatever tiny amount of anything successful we've done has been a long, long process of just building relationships with people we want to be around and talk to and trust. To have someone else do that is tough. I thought we could do something there and that didn't end up really working the way I would have thought. At the time, I was leaving a very big place. I didn't want to necessarily be sort of relegated to like the junior varsity high school team of, I wanted to still be relevant in a way. We wanted to build a credible enough business that I could still go to a big emerging managers conference or still have great people walk in our office. How many people did that require? We hired initially four full-time people. And so you have your team, maybe you get some office space, and now you've got your first anchor investor. How do you go about going to market with the story? We were very lucky in that a lot of people wanted help. Prime brokers were great. Uh, Capital introduction. We were invited to conferences. We did whatever the sort of playbook of hedge funds 10 years ago, we got handed that playbook and we did it. We tried. We launched in 2016, which was a, I wouldn't say necessarily a great year for capital raising. We weren't as successful in doing it, but, you know, we would meet with pretty much anyone who wanted a meeting. I mean, that was a lot, a lot, a lot of people. We probably did, gosh, 300 or so meetings in our first year, which looking back on it is completely ludicrous, but we didn't know what we didn't know. And through that, I learned a ton. To be fair to the people sitting across the table, I didn't really know how to explain my process very well in ways that it's so intuitive to me that it it took me almost probably at least 18 months to sort of figure out how to even describe thoughtfully what I do. And so we didn't have a differentiated way to go to market, which I think we kind of do now. And we kind of learned and got better and take a little bit of a different tack these days. So differentiation, the concept of differentiation to product differentiation in a space like hedge funds where there are, you know, 8,000 different funds just seems hard. How important is that when you're out telling the story? You asked a good question about when you're setting it up, what do you think? And for me, even more so than the business itself, I thought about what was different and how different it is and why that could be a positive. I think... One of the risks you run into in doing something, I wouldn't necessarily say dramatically different than some funds out there, but than most, is then your story becomes, okay, how do I fit you into this box? Don't you think what you're doing is ultra risky? I mean, of those 300 first meetings I had, probably 200 of those people told me why what I was doing was ludicrous and here's how they would do it and here's what their funds do. And my personal view is, okay, if I think this is the best way For me to run money, you know, to have the thought that someone else would kind of immediately gravitate towards that was really naive. And so we're intentionally trying to be different. But a lot of the problems, and I would say this to allocators out there, is when you launch and you maybe are doing something that's not well understood in the market, you get a lot of pushback. And then maybe I would even say to myself that we kind of pulled back a little bit and we'd go into meetings and we'd start even being vaguer or or more general about what we do. And then you end up sounding like every other fund. And then so you run into problems both ways. So 
I think <laughs> over time, we as a firm have become comfortable with this is what we do. When I talk to people now about it, I don't even describe a process. I say, this is what we have done and this is what we do with our companies because that's all I have. And that either resonates with people and they like it or most people it doesn't and you kind of move on. And that's just a much more efficient way to do it. You want to be a people pleaser to some extent initially. And I think that ran into trouble with one being at least too differentiated at first off and then maybe not being differentiated enough as we sort of pulled back a little bit on how we talked about the business. What was the most frustrating part of the process? Initially, when someone shows interest in you, especially starting out, I think the natural tendency is to really gravitate towards that. A couple of those situations didn't work out over 10, 15 meetings. A lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of energy. And there was no presumption that anyone would ever give us money, but you can't help but be a little bit disappointed by those outcomes. And the other frustrating thing thinking about it is it's more inward directed in that I wish we just accepted that we're going to build something we're really proud of. We're going to do it for a really long period of time and everything will work out. So just be patient. There was sort of an undue amount of pressure that was all self-imposed and that was a pretty big learning lesson for me. And it all worked out and it's all good and we're happy. But there were, again, getting back to this experience concept of being an entrepreneur, it's really hard to do that until you've done it. (laughs) So So at some point in time, you get ready for launch. You've been having a bunch of meetings. You've got this anchor. Maybe other people come on board. When do you decide, okay, what we have is enough and we're going to start? Or do you just keep doing meetings until you try to kind of hurdle cats and get more commitments? For us personally, we just, when our docs were done and the funds were open and our PB accounts were open, we went. There was no dollar target. We thought we would have more money initially than we did. We had a couple sort of soft commitments, if you will, and those didn't end up showing up on day one. Even our initial capital was a little bit less than what we thought day one. How much did you launch with on day one? Gosh, it was in the teens of millions of dollars. I don't remember exactly, but it wasn't a lot. (laughs) So we started trading because... (laughs) Our belief was that if we do a good job over a long enough time horizon, we'll be fine. And waiting around wasn't, certainly wouldn't raise us any more money. So we were excited to get going. Did that shortage of capital from your expectations, from your dollar amounts, impact your confidence at all when you went to start putting money to work? Not from an investing perspective, no. But you see the math. I mean, you see the budget. You know what you're burning. And that... I wouldn't say it feels great, but it didn't really, you sort of very much, at least we did, we compartmentalized that thing. And all I like doing is really sitting in a room and investing. So that was the bright positive in a, if you're spending six months with lawyers and PBs and pitching for money, that to me is, you know, there's nothing I'd rather do less. So it was fun to actually get going on the investing side. All right. So once you get going on the investing side, you're still having meetings, right? People are still coming in. You still would like to attract capital. How do you balance what you want to do, sort of sit in your office, do your thing, visit companies with that sort of necessary piece of continuing to grow the business? We tried to be as efficient as we could. So we went to three pretty big conferences our first year where we probably met with 50 or so people at each one, sort of a speed dating concept. But we met a lot of great, really thoughtful, smart people. If folks would come to our office in Boston, we'd be happy to take a meeting. And then I'd travel occasionally, but not that often. And so it wasn't really by choice or by design necessarily. The only marketing we have is if we can be half decent at our day job. And so we really tried to be as efficient as possible when we met with people and We've done a lot better at that over this year than we had certainly in the first two years because you just don't know. And it's it's not fair to have expectations of someone sitting across the table that they will or won't give you money. But if someone emails me and says they want an hour of our time, at least in the first two years, they said, great, I'd love to do that and happy to spend time with you. And I think as an emerging manager, it's really hard. I can now sort of understand if there's sincere interest or if there's not, and we're just much more efficient about that. But I couldn't have learned that other than going through the process. As you start investing, there's this known truth about investor behavior, whether it's a manager or an allocator, that people chase returns. You've had some good periods. You've had some weaker periods of performance. What happened from your perception of the outside interest? 
It's noticeable. It still is. We had a good first couple months. There was a lot of interest. We had our fourth month, we were down meaningfully in that nothing had really changed. Our four month total was great. Our first three months were really good. And our fourth month was a drawdown. It was evident within, again, four months that that was the behavior that you could see it in call volume, email volume, all of that. And so even our second year in business, we were relatively flat and had a couple really good months at the end of the year. And January, February, March of the next year, there was a ton of interest. And then you're flat for a while or down a little and it's crickets. And so What I would say is important is through those periods, you can kind of tell who believes in what you're doing for the long term and who doesn't. And for us, would it have been nice to raise more money and we had to compound that and it would have been good, I think. But truthfully, what volatility in our performance and sort of our lack of success, if you will, of fundraising, it's now allowed us to really focus in on working with really good people who believe in what we're doing for the long term. We've had drawdowns this year and we had a deal that was going to happen and broke and it was our largest position. And I didn't get a single phone call from one of our 50 LPs in a very bad month for our largest position, not one phone call. We proactively reached out to people, but that makes me feel comfortable in that for whatever we did, we ended up attracting the people who who kind of believe and allow us to invest in a way that will hopefully be successful over the long term. You mentioned earlier this combination of being very focused on the people you're going to work with and also not getting it all right on day one. What was that experience like? I think it's just this overarching theme of, I just didn't know what I didn't know. And I'd never really managed people in a business. I had folks work with me and for me, but it's very different in an entrepreneurial setting both from a who you want to partner with you from a investor perspective and who who you need around you to be your best, uh, perform at the highest level you can at your day job. When you start a fund, you have a small window in time to build a team and you can get really lucky with that or you can make some decisions that aren't reflective necessarily on the people, but just it wasn't going to be a fit. And that happened to us and it was... A learning experience. I wouldn't say it was fun, but it happened. And the good news is all of these things happened at a stage of our business where there wasn't a ton of risk. We didn't have a huge asset base. We didn't have a ton of people. If there's ever a time to learn these things, it was then. And so that was the way for us. I think that's from a lot of the entrepreneurs I talk to. It's so, so common in our business, in the asset management industry, it's viewed so differently than it is in a regular company that of course teams are gonna iterate and of course you're gonna try to find the right people and of course you're gonna try to build the right culture and that isn't necessarily a fit for everyone day one. In our business, it's viewed differently and so I was really almost scared to make the necessary changes to make it good for me, which ultimately is good for our investors, but at the end of it, You figure out that everyone will be fine. Everyone's probably going to be happier and better in a different spot. And you kind of work with what works for you and ultimately, hopefully do what's best for your investors. And that's something we went through. It's wildly typical in all of the people I've talked to and we work with. And it just so happens I made those mistakes in our business as well. What's the path that you went through from when you had an inkling that it might not work to sometime later, ultimately making a change on the team? Well, first and foremost, the blame lies at my feet. I felt very personally responsible for those people. I personally really liked everyone. Obviously, (laughs) it wouldn't have worked with them in the first place. Things turned out differently than I expected. And I think a lot of the difficulty in being a small business or startup is the mismatch between expectations and reality. And I think not having an appropriate calibration initially, I think you have to be optimistic by nature. And I was certainly, and things happened that weren't as we would have scripted. And you just try to do the best you can. You try to let, at least for me personally, it was important that we did as well as we could have to make sure that it all worked out for everyone. What are the couple of biggest misconceptions that you had about starting a fund that you've since learned? I think the hardest thing to do, and I really admire this and some of the smaller managers out there, there are some people who just want to invest and 
don't really have any of the externalities that we want as validation. I mean, that I admire. It wasn't me. I didn't want to just manage teens of millions of dollars in the suburbs by myself with the Bloomberg. Could have done that. Probably it would have been fun and fine, but I just, I really wanted to build something. And so I think calibrating expectations appropriately for what that means, other than a small select handful of people, I think the problem you have as an emerging manager is if you're not in that handful of folks who have spent years and years and years building relationships with large LPs at their prior firm, and you don't have this whole sort of social proof or have to get a now phenomenon at your open, it's really difficult to raise a lot of money unless you do it for three, four, five, six, seven, ten 10 years, right? Like I think everyone in our industry gravitates to the handful of successes every year as opposed to the reality of building a great business over time. Pretty much every manager I admire or look up to started the same way we did, you know? It just was 25 years ago. And you kind of forget that for whatever reason you want to chase some middle ground. You know you're not going to be the biggest and the best launch, but there's got to be something in the middle. And the reality is it's pretty binary. And that's okay. I don't think I'd do anything differently because we met a lot of great people along the way who may end up being investors of ours. It just probably is going to take them three years or four years or five years or never. But there's a pretty decent chance. And a lot of the folks I met along the way who weren't going to give us money initially, there's a handful of those people who I do think will be great partners for us for the long term. And you've got to start somewhere. So you may as well just kind of dive in. Yeah. What do you think is the biggest mistake you made? I think the biggest mistake I made was just feeling like I could effectuate an outcome, like just wanting something to happen when the only thing that was going to actually build what I wanted was partnering with good people, finding good investors, being patient, doing something different and hopefully adds value to people. It was more that we just felt like, okay, there's this opportunity out there. There's so much money out there for hedge funds. We should attract some portion of cash. Like, well, logically this should happen right and that was just a mismatch of what at least reality for us was but i feel really lucky in that (laughs) a lot of people talk to us about well business risk or small you might go away tomorrow i think the thing that i kind of figured out through this whole process was it's not necessarily size that's ever a part of the business risk i think it's if you have mismatch of expectations and your capital that is what really creates business risk. It doesn't matter if you're 5 billion or 10 billion or 50 billion or 50 million. My biggest mistakes were all generally self-inflicted. But again, getting back to this concept of entrepreneurship really is learning by doing. And we've done that and, and happy where it's turned out. From those early days, you've actually done quite well and grown. How did the business evolve from... This is just hard and we didn't give, our expectations weren't right and it was going to take a lot longer and now you're three years later. What started to click? It just was sort of one off. To be honest, you have to be grateful for and take pride in very, very small wins. So it's, hey, XYZ, great entrepreneur, great investor, or good person likes and trusts you enough to give you a small amount because they believe in you. And that's a huge win. You're not going to get really paid on it or it's not going to change anything. But that, I promise you, if you keep working with those people, you're amazed at how then they'll tell another person. And we're starting to get calls now being like, okay, what's the next thing you're working on? Inbounds. Like, we want to do more with you. And it's it's all incremental. You know, no one's walking in the door with enormous nine-figure checks. But it's just these little things that start to build on each other. And it's natural to have doubt initially of okay, this person said no, or they gave us a token amount of money that maybe they're just being nice because they don't want to like offend me. But once you start to change that perception from, okay, maybe they're just being nice to, oh, they actually like kind of like what we do. And you build that relationship. Everything just takes, it takes years. And those things are finally starting to happen. And that's been, it's been really cool. When I was at a big firm, I managed huge amounts of money for very, very large investors. Now I manage a little teeny bit of money, but for just like, I can't even believe how nice and cool and I can pick up the phone if we ever need anything to any of our LPs and they're there for me. 
And the reverse is true. They don't pick up the phone and are like, hey, why are you down 3% this month? They all get it. And I couldn't be happier with where we are, even though we're a long way from where we could theoretically be. But again, if you're happy, if you have good partners and you're doing what you love, that's success to me. And we've gotten lucky and just continue to sort of try to build on that. You mentioned some of these inbounds about, hey, can you do this? Can you do that? You started with a flagship hedge fund. How did you start considering, oh, should we incorporate a long only fund? Should we incorporate a series of SPVs? And what have you done? Another thing we've tried to be cognizant of is do people believe in the efficacy of our process, but not necessarily the mousetrap that it's being fit into? I don't have any hubris or belief around that. If we can be a solutions provider to folks who fall under the following category, good people, believe in what we do, willing to be long-term oriented, we will think about doing a solution that makes sense for them. I think if I had my druthers, we would have it all in one fund. But particularly as we're smaller, one of the things I wanted to make sure of is if different people had different views on volatility or duration that we could possibly look at these other products in order to satisfy a customer want or need without imposing anyone's particular view on our main fund. And so we've thought about partnering with folks on different products. We're not there yet. Tom, as you look out over the next year, what's your next most pressing goal for the business? To continue to find good investments. I want to spend as much time as I can really focusing on finding the two to four good ideas a year. And I wish I could find one tomorrow. And we've gotten a couple of great opportunities in the volatility of October. And we're going to spend 2019 really focused on effectuating outcomes in our current portfolio and hopefully finding a couple new good ideas. All right, Tom, let's turn to some closing questions. What is your favorite hobby or activity outside of work and family? The only thing I do these days is play golf outside of work and family, and that's my happy spot to be on a golf course. All right. Uh, And how's the golf game these days? It's pretty mediocre, but uh, (laughs) like our investing strategy, volatile, sometimes really good and sometimes pretty bad. So the overall's still half decent. All right. What's your biggest pet peeve? Arrogance. I mean, it's just a tough one. It happens a lot in our business. It's something that bothers me. So I wish there was a little bit more humility and gratitude in our world. What reading do you almost never miss? I never miss anything by either Jeremy Grantham or Howard Marks. Those are probably my two favorite letters. And then obviously the annual report from Buffett. But I'm sure uh, that's like a lot of folks in our business. What teaching from your parents has most stayed with you? Think twice and act once. I still learn that lesson over and over every day. But uh, that's probably the biggest one for me. All right. Last one. What life lesson have you learned that you wish you knew a lot earlier in life? I think just to be patient and grateful for where you are. You always are pushing to do something and it's only going to come in the appropriate amount of time. And so I think that holds true for what I'm doing now and certainly for the future too. Awesome. Thanks, Tom. Thank you. Before you take off, I've created three different ways for you to stay updated on the podcast and my blog according to your preferences. First, you can sign up to receive a monthly email with a few great things I've read and listened to over the month. Second, for more prompt delivery, you can subscribe to my blog and receive emails when each podcast episode and blog post come out. And last, you can access the full library of transcripts by signing up for a premium subscription. All three options are available on the homepage at capitalallocatorspodcast.com. Thanks for your support. 